morning. Welcome to the webinar on conversations in central banking. This is a webinar organized by the Master of Central Banking Program of the Asia School of Business. I am Eli Remolona, Professor of Finance at the Asia School of Business. The topic today is approaches to central to approaches to financial crises. As you know, not all financial crises are created equal. Some of them are homegrown, perhaps fed by a bursting property bubble. Others barge in from the outside like an unwanted infectious guest. So how do central banks manage these different crises? Today, we are fortunate to have two very eminent panelists to discuss the issues. The focus of the discussion will be on crisis management, resolution, and recovery, rather than causes and prevention. Let me now introduce our panelists. Patrick Honahan was governor of the Central Bank of Ireland from September 2009 to November 2015. Before that, he was at the World Bank as a senior advisor on financial sector issues. He has spent earlier spells at the Central Bank of Ireland, at the IMF, uh, and he is now a non-resident fellow at the Peterson Institute in Washington, DC. His PhD in economics is from the London School of Economics. Um, he has written on financial crisis, including about how different policy approaches have affected the overall cost of these crises in both developing countries and advanced economies. Mark Goodmanson was the governor of the Central Bank of Iceland from 2009 to 2019. Before that, he was my boss at the BIS, where he was deputy head of the Monetary and Economic Department. One thing we were involved in was organizing the meeting for governors of the small open economies. Um, I think Jose was uh, part of that meeting. Uh, uh, if Jose remembers, I've, uh, but I've been told by some of the governors that that was a really fun meeting. Mar has an MPhil in economics from the University of Cambridge, and he has served on the editorial boards of economic journals in Iceland, at the BIS, and in the UK. We will start with Patrick Honan, uh, who will uh, give uh, his remarks, uh, and then he will, he will be followed by Mark Goodmanson. Patrick? Thanks very much, Eddie, and uh, it's great to be here at an, an, another of these interesting webinars. I, I want to talk about the role of the central bank in, in managing banking crises, so take that, um, that angle on it. Uh, and I think it's a very good time to talk about this issue, uh, because I think with the pandemic and the uh, recession associated with it, we are heading into a period of heightened likelihood of bank failures in different countries. I don't know where, I don't know which, but it's obvious that we're in, in a, a period of, of heightened uh, risk of this kind of event. We have a lot of experience over the last uh, number of decades of banking crises in, in modern times. So it's not just the global financial crisis. We had East Asia in the late 1990s. We had the Nordic crises in several countries a decade earlier. We had Latin America many times uh, before then. So, so we have a lot of experience to, to, um, to learn from how people manage these crises. And the management of the crisis, well, the burden generally falls rather heavily on the central bank, even if that's not the way it's supposed to be, but that's the way it happens. Uh, not only the management uh, burden, but very often the, the financial burden falls on, on the central bank. Uh, and that's even if the central bank is not the bank regulator, uh, which it is in, in many countries, and it was in my own country, Ireland, at the, the crisis of, uh, that, that, that started, that broke out in 2008. Um, and so if the central bank is the regulator, I think you, you get a lot of different types of, of impact on the central bank. First of all, it's the attitude the, of the central bankers themselves. It's certainly it's a shock. Nobody's planning for a, central, for a banking crisis. You have shock, you have a period of denial, uh, then you have a period of demoralization as people realize that somebody messed up. Um, 
Now, my own direct involvement in the Irish case was 12 months in, so I, I can't say that I had the first, first-hand experience of, of those phases, but I certainly have, uh, have analysed them and looked back at it, as well as at other cases. So what I want to suggest is that, and, and discuss, are the four questions, I think these are the four questions, most important questions that call for urgent answers at the outset. Um, some of them are easier to answer than others. I, the four of them are the depth of the whole, uh, the solvency whole. That's number one. The second question is, is the situation that's emerging, is it is a systemic situation or not? Is it something that can be contained? One institution deal with it. The third question is, should the approach involve bail-in of bank creditors or bail-out? And the fourth question is the foreign exchange dimension, uh, foreign exchange relating to bank liabilities, relating to currency matters. So let me go through just those four uh, questions uh, and, and say a few words about, about each of them. First of all, how deep is the solvency hole? So you discover one bank or more than one bank is in difficulty. It is very hard to find out how deep is the insolvency because a week or two weeks or, or a month beforehand, nobody thought this bank was in, in, insolvent. Maybe it is insolvent. So it's really, there's always an element of surprise in a banking crisis. Nobody expects a banking crisis. Some people may fear there might be one, but nobody says this is definitely, some people say that they say, but they don't know. The typical timeline of uh, expectations and appreciation of the losses and the, and the hole in the solvency hole, it starts with an underestimate. That's your period of denial. Okay, there's something wrong, but nothing very serious. So an underestimate for a while, and then that slips into an overestimate. And I think we've seen, I've seen this time and again in analyzing <clears throat> different countries' situation. An overestimate, people think that the situation is much worse than it actually is. And then eventually there's a gradual convergence on a final estimate. And even that final estimate, which may be 10 years after the crisis starts, very often there's recrimination. There shouldn't have been those losses. The thing was badly managed. We were all right. The bank was not that insolvent, but what the government and the central bank did with it caused uh, the situation to worsen. In Ireland, in September 2008, which is more or less the same time as Lehman's, just a couple of weeks after Lehman's, <clears throat> the perception of the authorities of the central bank was there's no insolvency. It's just a liquidity problem. It's something that has spilt over from the rest of the world. We are all right here. So we just need to, uh, to deal with this as a liquidity issue. But eventually, the losses, the, the, the net cost, the net net cost to the Irish government was 25% of GNP. That's net net after all the recoveries. We're now 12 years after that. I suppose we're close to, to knowing the final figure. So I, I'm confident in putting that 25% figure out. And even so, the debate continues. I, I know a couple of former directors. I'm thinking of one in particular, directors of, of, of banks in Ireland who denied that the losses were inevitable. I don't know why there was all this intervention that our bank was fine. Um, mm. Well, so there, you, you see that, that pattern. And such debates continue elsewhere. I mean, it's a very interesting book by Larry Wall on, on Lehman and just how, how deep the hole was there. And there are other countries where this remains much debated. Second question, is it systemic? You know, if the situation is not systemic, then maybe you can deal with a bank in isolation. The rest of the financial system can go on uh, working normally without some special interventions. The question of whether a bank is systemic or a couple of banks is systemic or not, are systemic or not, it's contingent on the circumstances and it's time varying. So there might be times where one, a particular bank that you're looking at, you say, well, that bank is not a systemic bank, but at other times it may seem to be systemic. A big failure, a big banking failure, isolated one, can be absorbed if it's happening in a strong economy, robust confidence, everybody says, oh, look, there's a bank over there, something went wrong. It's like a plane crash. It's not affecting everything. And the central bank will often be the one called on to make this decision. I think a great example of this is in Spain, 2017, there's a bank called Banco Popular, quite a big bank. But the Bank of Spain refused them emergency liquidity assistance and said, nope, 
this is not a systemic issue. Uh, we don't need to, uh, to make emergency, uh, emergency provision. What sort of things come into that judgment? Well, for me, I think that one of the most important issues is this payment system. Is the payment system going to continue to function without this bank? Or is it at the heart of the payment system and it's going to disrupt everything? And that you need to know. You need to, the central bank needs to know how deeply embedded this, the bank that's, that's failing is in the payment system. The other question, much harder to assess is, will there be contagion? Will there be domestic contagion to other banks in the system? Will there be international contagion? If the bank is intervened and taken out of the market with wound down with defaults to creditors. You know, the whole question of domestic contagion is very much discussed and it has often made central banks reluctant to take drastic action. One case I think is an interesting one, which always was referred to as an Indonesia case in 1998. It was an IMF program. Some of the weak banks were intervened, but not all of the weak banks, and, and that was followed by runs on the others. So it was definitely contagion, um, and you, you have that sort of spectre uh, faces every central banker deciding whether they're going to uh, take extraordinary action. In Ireland, end of September 20, 2008, third largest bank was in trouble. It had a very limited role in payments. It was a wholesale bank, really. Um, for property developers. But the fragile confidence situation internationally and nationally in that post Lehman's weeks, um, well, it was clearly systemic in the circumstances of the time. And indeed, even two years later, international spillovers uh, from uh, the idea of bailing in some of the creditors of, of that bank were feared by ECB, uh, to some extent by the IMF, the IMF invoked a systemic exception in their, in their loan to Ireland because they were afraid of spillovers to the rest of the European banking system. So that really brings us to the third question, which is bail in or bail out. Now, if you're going to bail in, you need to move fast. Why? Because delay allows well-informed creditors to exit, which increases the cost on the remaining people. It helps if there's a clear legal waterfall of creditors allowing bail-in of a slice of debt while maintaining the vital economic functions to continue in a going concern segment of the, of, of the failing bank. So it's, you, this is where bailable debt, not just subordinated debt, subordinated debt, okay, that gives you a ranking in a liquidation, but it doesn't allow you to keep the core of the business going. Whereas a bailable debt allows you to smoothly, say, have a debt for equity swap while the operations, the vital operations of the bank continue. And that's the heart of the FSB's Financial Stability Board's international initiative on this. And it's manifested in the European Union's resolution legislation, which we now have 2040, but we didn't have, we didn't have that kind of waterfall in 2008. The depositors in Ireland and the bondholders were pari, ranked pari passu. The Americans have that, uh, have, have a, a distinction for, for uh, oh, four or five decades, but uh, not, in, not in, in Ireland and not in most European countries. So the government guaranteed everything, transferring the default risk to the government finances, which in the end was managed only with the help of an IMF program. And because the government had guaranteed the, the banks, the central bank ended up holding a large block of government promissory notes, which collateral for the emergency lending that had been made to the worst banks. And that brings me to the last point, foreign exchange issues. Key point here, the central bank, any central bank has limited scope to cover the foreign currency liabilities of a failing bank. You're, you got, you're talking about your foreign exchange reserves. You don't have unlimited uh, money creation ability. <clears throat> I'm sure Mar will talk about the Iceland experience. It's very relevant to there. And the point I want to make here is very popular talk now about foreign exchange swaps. <clears throat> Much, many more of them now in 2020 than we had ever before. But beware of foreign exchange swaps. A central bank may end up owing the Federal Reserve or, or, or People's Bank of China or Euro, European Central Bank dollars or euros or maybe which went to bail out bondholders of what turns out to be a deeply insolvent bank. So that's quite a risky, quite a risky thing to have. And what about the currency? Well, some depreciation of the currency can be, it can be like a quasi bail-in of the creditors. Thailand in the 1980s is a case in, in point. Or capital controls. If you don't want 
It might buy you time. It might limit currency overshooting. Some depreciation might be good, but a lot of depreciation might be bad. Again, Mar might have some remarks on that in the Iceland case. <clears throat> in the Euro area, which was my case, Euro is not a national, it is a national currency, but it's not a national currency because it's a sort of foreign exchange because it's, it's, a, it's an international currency that you national don't have full control over it. But the National Central Bank can have unlimited, in principle, unlimited access to Euro for emergency liquidity provision, as long as the other member national central banks do not object. And so the Central Bank of Ireland used this in large scale. At one point, emergency liquidity was briefly exceeded 100% of GDP. So that was a mechanism of handling the foreign exchange issue very sui generis. Conclusion, judgments and decisions must be made in a hurry. A wrong choice may impose sizable economic and political costs, or they may result in chaos from unmanaged disruption of banking and payments. Take your choice. Hmm. That's my intervention at this point. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, very interesting, very interesting. So it's a challenge uh, in managing the crisis. Uh, it's hard to tell in real time how deep it is, how uh, systemic it is. And yet, if you're gonna do a bail-in, you have to move fast. So that becomes a real challenge for, uh, for managing the crisis. Uh, let me turn now to Mar. Uh, as Patrick said, uh, Iceland had uh, some experience, especially in the foreign exchange dimension of the crisis. Mar, may I invite you to uh, introduce the issues? You're on mute, uh, Mar. So thank you, Ali, and also thank you to the Asian School of Business for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to speak here today on these very interesting issues. Uh, so what I am going to do, I, and I will address some of the topics that, uh, <laughs> that Patrick mentioned, is to look at what I will call critical heterodox elements for crisis management and, and bank resolution in the 2008 financial crisis in Iceland. Um, and the key question is, uh, so what, what was the rationale of what was done? What was the outcome? And what might be the potential relevance for other countries? Um, now, uh, and these are uh, bank resolution, capital controls and exchange rate policy. But before I go into that, I, I would like to uh, go a little bit back to your introduction, and thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, I had the pleasure after I became governor to sit on the small open economies meeting at the BS, and was uh, after Armando Tetango, a chairman of the group for several years, and I hope that Armando is one among the participants here. And a lot of my thinking on these issues uh, were shaped uh, in my BIS period and also from the Icelandic crisis, but not least in this in this very valuable uh, discussions. Now, I have to give you some context uh, for uh, uh, looking at these uh, three elements. Uh, so the Icelandic financial crisis of 2008 was both a currency crisis and a banking crisis. And as uh, Patrick has alluded to, uh, in Ireland, it was a banking crisis, but not a currency crisis because the ECB provided a stable currency. Uh, and, and therefore, it is also very big in that sense. Uh, and the banking crisis itself was very big because it was almost 10 times GDP, the balance sheets of this bank. Mm -hmm. and, and then you had, in addition, you had very big and sustainable uh, macroeconomic imbalances. Now, uh, uh, so, so the issues of whether what the banks were facing was, uh, 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 was, was a liquidity crisis or, 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 a, or a solvency crisis was almost irrelevant in this kind of a setting because the banks, uh, uh, they faced liquidity problems for sure, but these liquidity problems were mostly in foreign currency and they were going to be equally dead if they were not able to roll over these uh, foreign currency debts 
irrespective of how much capital was in there in, in, in the first place. So, so you, you, you didn't uh, want to, you needed to make, you didn't make, uh, need to make adjustments, so to speak. And then what was very important was that the crisis was fueled by strong adverse amplifying mechanisms and negative feedback loops where the exchange rate comes very much uh, into play. So first of all, you had the sudden stop of financing of a double-digit current uh, account deficit. So that was no longer possible. So you had to adjust. You had the run on foreign financing of big international active banks. And in the end, you had no way to deal with that. And then uh, thirdly, you, you had this interaction of exchange rate depreciation, which was very significant, 50% in the course of uh, 2008. This interacted with high private sector uh, in debt debts and big foreign currency mismatches. So the exchange rate in this kind of situation was very much a shock amplifier. And then finally, the, the, uh, the banking failures, they threatened the function of, of, of payment intermediation in the country. So it was imperative to stabilize the immediate financial situation, to stop these uh, feedback mechanisms in order to get anywhere. Uh, and these were potential further disorderly capital, big capital flows, further exchange rate depreciation, and potential failing of basic banking services in the country. Which everybody thinks that the Icelanders, they allow the banks to collapse, and that is fine. But that is only partly true, because if your banking system, your domestic banking system completely collapsed, you will not find. So that is not what happened in Iceland. Now, and by stabilizing this, uh, you uh, would create the conditions for orderly cleaning of the policies, which would take time, building of a new banking system, and macro rebalancing of the, of, of the economy. So let me go through the uh, three elements so you understand this better. First, uh, crisis management regarding the banks and bank resolution. So what was done was the following. The failing banks, uh, they were placed into resolution regimes. There was no other option. And domestic banks were carved almost overnight uh, out of these banks. These were much smaller banks, 1.7 times GDP. And then the idea was that uh, the estates of the old banks would be fully compensated uh, uh, for, for any asset and liability transfers. Uh, we introduced deposit preference, but that was not, uh, so that was needed to change the legislation. And a, and a declaration was made that deposit in Iceland was safe. Uh, so this was not a, a bailing in, in a sense as we understand it now, uh, because this is a kind of a bailing exactly or some sort. It was more bailout of depositors. Of course, that had consequences for recovery rates for equity holders or bond holders, but that is basically what it was. And the rationale for this was to keep the banking services up and running, and especially the payment intermediation and the common citizens' access uh, to the deposits to ring fence the sovereign vis-a-vis -vis the failing banks. And remember, these were private banks with high, very high share of, of, of their big balances. They are nominated for a currency. So if the government had decided to go the Irish way, which was in the case of Ireland, it would have bankrupted the country because these were debt in a currency that the central bank of the country did not print. So, and in the absence of international cooperation, this was probably the only sound option. So what was the outcome? Yeah, it was partly bumpy to begin with. It was a bumpy road. And we had the ISAF dispute partly because of what was done uh, during this uh, few days when the banks collapsed. And remember, the IMF was not, on, uh, was not in at the time. This was a purely Icelandic solution. But it resulted over time in a sound and well-capitalized domestically oriented banking system and the domestic payment system never failed. Now, to capital controls. Uh, uh, these comprehensive capital controls that were introduced on outflows, they were part of the IMF program and they were proposed by the IMF, not by the Icelandic authorities. I think they made a very good sense, but they were proposed by the IMF. And what it did 
they helped to stabilize the Aspen Trail after the fall in 2008. They created a space for cleaning up for domestic balances and for domestic macroeconomic policies to mitigate the recession and promote recovery. Without them, you see a retrospect, uh, interest rates in Iceland would have had to have been significantly higher in order to try to stabilize the exchange rate. And the rationale or the reason behind it was that there were direct foreign krona positions, something like 40% of GDP, and unhedged domestic assets, uh, assets amounting to 25% of GDP within the estates of the failed bank. So you had very big overhang that risked economic and financial stability in the case of this orderly exit. So what was the outcome? Yes, the cut the controls served their intended purpose. And the negative side effects that many of us talked about, that they would increase with time, and I said that on several occasions, have so far been difficult to measure. And they were mostly lifted 2015 to 17 through a sequence of orderly process and without derailing economic and financial stability. And finally, exchange rate policy. So stabilization of the exchange rate was a key goal of the economic program with AMF. And then it became a temporary intermediate target of monetary policy. We had an inflation target, but it was somewhat overwritten by the imperative of trying to stabilize the exchange rate. And it was, of course, supported, supported by capital controls. This later morphed into a money slope. Before the crisis, we had that free float, and this morphed into a money slope. And the rationale was basically that the exchange rate was a shock amplifier. In these conditions, we had classical overshooting, uh, the depreciation and currency mismatches. And what is also important, there was a limited positive short-term effect on exports due to capacity constraints in critical sectors like fish and aluminum. So it worked mostly in the short run through import compression and the initial depreciation was, was sufficient for, for, that, for that. So the outcome, it worked very well, especially after the enforcement of the capital controls were fixed in the autumn of 2009. And the low real exchange rate level that we had to risk then have over time to rebalance the economy. It took a few years, but it did. And since then, uh, the exchange rate has been a shock absorber, and is so in the current uh, managed float regime, where you use foreign exchange dimensions and other tools, including temporary capital flow management tools on the inflow side, which have helped to bring about that uh, outcome. And, and the cost, because the issue is always if you, if you have these very big depreciations that you have inflation going up and, 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 and being entrenched. And we certainly have the temporary inflation soils, which went up to 18% or thereabouts after the initial depreciation. But over time, inflation came down to target and inflation expectations became accurate. The target is 2.5%. And average inflation has been 2.4% 2013 to 2019. So that worked well. And finally, so what is the relevance of, of this for other countries? Now, we have to acknowledge that well-designed crisis management and, res and, uh, and resolution will depend on the concrete situation and will therefore, in many instances, have various cases specific factors and heterodox elements that might be less relevant in other situations and in other countries. So what about these three? And, and I will go through them from least relevant to most relevant. And first, capital, comprehensive capital controls. They should really be reserved for extreme situations. And there are probably several aspects of Iceland's characteristics and concrete situation at the time that made them less costly than otherwise. So I would not recommend them if you don't need them uh, try to avoid it. Uh, now, how we dealt with the failing banks. So 
How we did it was to begin with not universally well received, to say the least. But that has changed with time, and the sentiment that taxpayers should be spared when private banks fail has gained ground. And some form of bail-in is more accepted, and deposit preference is the case in many countries around the world. But, but these were, on the whole, irrespective, extreme measures in an extreme situation um, that the reform crisis prevention framework, framework should strive to avoid. So having banks that are 10 times your GDP with a, a FX uh, balance sheet that is maybe two third to three fourths of that, you should avoid that. And finally, I think that Iceland experience with minus float and more generally with the use of more instruments to preserve monetary and financial stability is arguably highly relevant for small and open economies with flexible exchange rates that aim to be significantly but safely financially integrated. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Mark. Very fascinating. Uh, so bold measures by, uh, by Iceland, but uh, Iceland almost had no choice. The numbers were so big relative to the economy. Deposit preference, uh, for example, and uh, you were able to turn the exchange rate from being a shock amplifier to a shock absorber. I think that's fascinating. Let me now open the floor to questions and uh, comments. Um, let me start with a question from the chat box. So one question is for Patrick. Uh, uh, Patrick, uh, you had said that um, this pandemic could very well lead to, uh, to banking failures. Uh, can you say more about that? What's, the, what's your sense of the risk of that uh, uh, in Ireland or elsewhere, of, uh, of the risk coming out of the pandemic? Yeah. Well, I think it's, a, it's the $64,000 question, even though $64,000 doesn't seem like an awful lot of money to be... Um, <laughs> to be paying for such an important question. We know a number of things are favorable to uh, survival of banks now in the new situation. They're much more capitalized than they were heading into the global financial crisis. And that's because of decisions taken about minimum capitalization and better quality of the assessment of the, uh, of the quality of that capital and the, the value of the assets in, in the bank's balance sheet. So that means that they've, the shareholders uh, provide a larger buffer, a larger buffer uh, to, to absorb loan losses that, that might occur. Nevertheless, it's a very deep crisis and a very specialized crisis um, focused on certain sectors of the economy, uh, particularly transportation, hospitality sectors and, and the like. So it would be very surprising if there weren't a lot of bankruptcies in those sectors in different countries. It and so how that will affect the banking system depends on the details of the financing of such, of such firms and whether they, banks are really exposed to these or whether the financing has come from more uh, uh, you know, investment firms and uh, private equity and so forth. So this is a very drill down onto details. And I don't think anybody outside the regulatory system or outside uh, detailed analysis of, of each banking system uh, and each bank really has a clear picture yet on, on where there will be spots of insolvency. It is highly likely that there would be individual banks, perhaps only medium-sized banks, I would think, that uh, have concentrated on sectors that have been particularly exposed. Uh, and, and so I, I, it, would be, it would be remarkable if there weren't a range of banking failures around the world, but perhaps not concentrated and perhaps not therefore systemic in any individual country are causing spillovers. So you couldn't be somewhat optimistic about that. Uh, bank shareholders probably uh, are right to have marked down the value of, of uh, the, the shares, the stock markets, the shares, the shares of banks. But in terms of the effect on the public finances, on the stability of economies, maybe, it, maybe we will survive better relative to the depth of this recession than otherwise. But I'm not holding 
I'm not taking any, making any bets at this stage. It's a risky situation. Um, spots of insolvency, and perhaps many such spots of insolvency, but maybe, yes. not, maybe not systemic, and maybe not, uh, not contagious. Uh, is that your sense, uh, Patrick? Uh, uh, that, that so far is, is my sense, but uh, everybody needs to be very alert and, and see what happens. And we also have new mechanisms, as we talked about, new me resolution mechanisms, which uh, yes, can yes, manage yes. to step in and contain those. Yes. Uh, um, Mar, I wonder whether you, you can comment on the, the notion of, uh, uh, I think Patrick said, we have to be wary about the foreign exchange swaps, the swaps that... Uh, were offered by the Fed. Uh, Iceland did not use those swaps, I understand, but um, well, can you comment on that? Uh, what do you think, Mar? Um, yes, yes, I can. I'm, and I, I agree with Patrick that uh, it wouldn't make any sense uh, to use short term effort swaps uh, to make any kind of risky lending to, to, to banks. So, but, where, but that doesn't mean uh, that it's necessarily better be, to be excluded from the swap uh, arrangement than to be, be included. I think it's better to be included because those countries that got swap and also this time around, uh, they get confidence effects from it. And, and, and secondly, you can, in principle, lend to banks using uh, FX swaps uh, uh, without uh, running risk with your own finances, provided, of course, that you take FX collateral that they have, and, and in some cases, for some of the collateral that the Icelandic banks have, in spite of the difficulties, was pure gold. Mm -hmm. So, so that is that is possible. So. So with, a, with that kind of arrangement, you, you can, in principle, uh, uh, try to deal with foreign currency liquidity problems. Because basically what happened during the 2008 crisis, there was a run on dollar liabilities all around the world. And in that kind of situation, you need a lender of last resort. And the lender of last resort should only be the US Fed. And, and in some sense, the central banks that were included turned into branches of the US, US Fed. Mm. And if that system is complete and you, you and you call it our policy sound, then you can uh, at least minimize the risk uh, that uh, Patrick is talking about. But I agree with him that it is not good for just unsick un 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 should be avoided for uh, yes, lending. Yes, sir. Uh... There's a very interesting question from the floor. Uh, I realized that the crisis in Ireland was quite different from the crisis in Iceland. But nonetheless, uh, Patrick, do you see elements of uh, the response of uh, Iceland uh, to their crisis that could have been helpful for Ireland, uh, for Ireland's uh, crisis management? You see elements of that. And Mar, do you see elements of Ar Ireland's response that could have been helpful to uh, to Iceland. To Iceland. But you know, we, we debate this, and, and Mara and myself have debated it uh, for for a long time, and uh, it's it's an it's a very interesting question. Uh, do I think it would have been better to have a national currency to to devalue to absorb? Uh, no, I, I think that uh, our experience with national currencies uh, that are volatile has, has not been good in Ireland. And uh, we actually got, though we, we could have hoped for more, we got a lot of assistance from the European institutions in, in handling the crisis. So, so as I say, we could have asked for more. This question very often comes down to the question of bail-in and, and whatever you call it, the losses to, to creditors of, of banks in Iceland. Uh, certainly, uh, I've often said that the, uh, the guarantee of the, by the Irish government was far too broad and uh, they could have excluded old debt, they could have excluded subordinated debt from the guarantee and that would have saved a couple of billion and a couple of billion here and there and you're, soon you're talking real money 
So uh, there, there are elements of, of what, what Iceland did, which uh, w in retrospect, w w one would have liked to do. Both economies recovered quite strongly. Both economies, uh, Iceland probably suffered some reputation damage. Um, even though there was no default, uh, and that's wor worth emphasizing, of the Iceland sovereign, uh, the, there was probably some, de some reputation damage, but the credit ratings of both countries by now have uh, re recovered to, to uh, reasonably good levels. Ireland a little bit higher than Iceland, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, maybe Iceland, mm -hmm. some of the elements, yes, would have used it, but certainly wouldn't have gone down the whole path of Iceland. I see, I, I see. How about you, Mar? What do you think? Uh, would Iceland have used something that uh, Ireland did? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the answer that I'm going to give that that maybe Iceland should have been in Ireland's position when it <laughs> came to the currency. Maybe, maybe, because uh -huh. because as as you as you know, uh, Iceland crisis was. Uh, uh, both a current crisis and a banking crisis. And then the banking crisis was, in, in a sense, also a current crisis because of the, uh, of, of the composition of the balance sheets of the bank. And, and, and it is always one of the options to deal with the problems of being a small open economy that wants to be finally in, in integrated uh, to enter a monetary union because then you stop being small in a monetary sense and you have a lender last resort uh, for that can back up banks that are even doing international business but having said that uh, uh, there are there are a lot of drawbacks and we have a lot of drawbacks in the setup in the european union in this regard some of that is being rectified now or attempts are being made to banking union and and, and such like and but if Iceland had been uh, a full member of the Eurozone, uh, and not to speak of Eurozone, not the Eurozone of today, but the Eurozone of the future, then uh, it is not clear whether that the banks would necessarily have collapsed. So, um, uh, but, uh, but this shows that all of this is in real time, all this can't be specific. And, it's very difficult to pick something from Ireland or for Ireland to pick something from Iceland. We were in a different situation. Patrick, uh, you mentioned how important the payment system is. Uh, the involvement of a bank in a payment system is a critical, it's a critical thing. Uh, presumably, it's not so hard to tell whether a bank is part of a, an important part of the payment system, and. Uh, Presumably, that's the reason for the deposit preference that Iceland uh, did. Uh, would you would you say it's not so hard to tell that a bank is involved in the in the payment system or plays a critical role in the payment system? I think that's that's probably true. In the more complex in the more complex uh, developed systems in New York, and, and that you you can find some as as was discovered around the time of Lehman's. Some banks that were banking entities that were not commercial banks were not subject to the regulation of the Federal Reserve actually were heavily involved in uh, in the payment system or in parts that are close in the derivative system that are so close to the payment system, um, yes, uh, even yes. uh, insurance firms and, and so forth. So uh, yes, if if you're following what's going on uh, as a regulator, in the, you you ought you ought to, to know. Uh, in this context, though, it's one of the one of the drivers of the new discussion about central bank digital currency has to do with this um, uh, this because if 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 instead of holding a, a bank current account you're actually holding a central bank digital currency for all your payments functions and even if it's a, if it's operated through a, a commercial bank but it, that it's a claim on the then you have a, a complete um, insulation of at least that part of the payment system from the failure of any particular bank, even if it's an agent. The agent falls over, but still you have a claim on the on the um, central bank and that can claim absolutely continues and the payment system associated with it continues. So that is an interesting new dimension that, that will ease the problem in future. If a central bank does the central bank uh, digital currency right, uh, then this, uh, this will help with uh, we're dealing with a crisis, should the crisis uh, 
happen. Indeed. Any comments on this, Mark, or any uh, any remarks on this on the on the whole issue of the payment system? Yeah, of course. It, this was very important, and and, and I think it's very important. All, all, all typical banking crisis cases. Uh, central bank digital currency is an issue for the future and, and would, of course, uh, mitigate this problem. But uh, the fact of the matter is, we, all, all of us, we need access to our bank account to function. And if for some reason we can't do it because the bank has failed or there is no electricity or whatever, you cannot buy necessities. And, uh, and, and with COVID, I mean, I have, people are using less and less cash. So, so uh, uh, of course, central bank digital currency is, is a solution to this. Maybe uh, that, will, that will come. And I have a suspicion that it will, because central bank will, will put there to provide the public with a risk-free means of payment. And uh, if, uh, if we are in a situation where uh, cash fund uh, speculation is almost disappearing, uh, you can ask the question, is the central bank fulfilling mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So we will we'll see. This has been a very uh, fascinating uh, panel discussion. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, so I think at this stage, I want to ask the panelists to offer some uh, concluding remarks, uh, uh, if I may. Um, can I ask you, Patrick, to, uh, to give uh, final remarks uh, for this discussion? Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I uh, think is extremely important in managing the whole process of recovery from a financial crisis, or in particular a banking crisis, or any kind of crisis, is uh, to provide to investors and consumers and to you know, diplomatic partners, other central banks, or a clear path. Where are you going? Uh, what is the end path? What are you trying to achieve? And is the path that you have chosen a credible one? I think this is vital to accelerate the recovery of economic activity. Uh, and I think this will be important, not only in banking crises, but also in fiscal crises that may emerge in this pandemic, post this pandemic, particularly for a number of countries in uh, emerging and developing economies uh, who will find their public finances rather stressed. And I think this is where the interaction with IMF programs can become absolutely vital that uh, a particular small economy may find that the investors are walking away and they want to get their money out because they've seen a big growth in, in the debt ratio, both of the banking system, but also of the, uh, the, the public finances. And they say, I don't know enough about this country. All I see is risk. I want to get out. Hmm. And it's very hard for a small economy to say, trust us, we're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. They need to have a credible path, but they also need to have a credible path that's endorsed. And it's the old, it's an old practice of the IMF to, uh, to be able to say, um, we've come in and looked at this country and we, uh, we endorse the path and look, we've done the calculations and you can look at them yourselves. These are not easy calculations and the IMF mm -hmm. doesn't always get it right. And I won't mention mm -hmm. names of countries that are currently in the situation where they have heavy indebtedness, both to the IMF and to other countries and, and uh, mm -hmm. where the path has not been a, a sustainable path. Calculating debt sustainability is uh, an art, not a science. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that needs to be improved. Debt sustainability isn't a mechanical or economic concept alone. It is a political concept. And during the banking crisis in Ireland, I used to get strings of investors would come in and say, well, what's going on in Ireland? Um, and they wouldn't, normally they wouldn't be so rude as to say, are you guys going to default? But that was really the question in their minds. Are you guys going to default? And I used to say to them, solvency is a political issue and the politics do not favor default. Mm 
I used to also say another thing, which you, you um, might permit me to um, go off on a tangent, mm. uh, because mm. polit politics is very much embedded in this, in this whole thing, both for deciding who, who bail in, bail out, and, and, and so forth. I used to say to them, look at our senior politicians, look at their age. They're all in their 60s, some mm. even get going to the, towards 70. Um, they have seen this sort of problem before. We had a fiscal crisis in the 1980s. Mm. They don't care so much about getting re-elected. They care about their reputation in the history books. Do not worry. They are going to pull the country out of, out of this and no political trickery. That proved to be correct. And I think the mm. investors were somewhat convinced that it was, a, it was a credible path economically and a credible path politically. So I speak in those broad terms, you, the central bank has a role in, in convincing and in communication, but it also has the technical role with which I started, which is quick decisions, mm. quick technical uh, professional expertise on what's going on, uncovering uh, the, the, the scale of the problem, whether it can be contained or is it systemic, whether the government should be advised to bail in or bail out, and then Finally, what are you going to do about the exchange rate, which at the end of the day is a, a crucial issue for most central banks. If it's not the exchange rate, it's monetary policy. It's so interesting, Patrick. So credible path um, with the help of credible politicians, uh, maybe older politicians and maybe even older central bankers uh, to advise on the, on the critical path. Uh, Mar? Uh, uh, can I invite you to uh, give uh, your closing remarks, Mar? Um, yes, Eli, thank you. I'm not going to comment on older politicians. Uh, we see in a big country that they have many shapes and, and come in different forms, and, <laughs> and that is no security uh, in any, any way. So I'm going to make two short comments. First of all, about the sovereign and the banking crisis. Um, uh, Iceland sovereign was downgraded very sharply mm -hmm. after the measures it took uh, in dealing with the bank. And in retrospect, that didn't make any sense because the risk that uh, the sovereign faced before these decisions were taken where that it would somehow take over the liabilities of these banks, and then it would surely have defaulted. Mm. But having taken the decision to take very extreme measures to preserve the credit of the sovereign by severing the link, uh, uh, the risk was getting less of a sovereign default. So I sometimes wonder what the rating agencies are measuring. Because the fact of the matter, uh, the sovereign in Iceland paid every krona in full, on time, and and, and, and all debt in the currency it was denominated. So that's number one. Number two is that I see we have talked about uh, uh, crisis management and resolution, but uh, but I I think we. I think we uh, have to bear in mind that, at least in my mind, you 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 haven't fully uh, gone through the resolution and recovered from the crisis if you haven't uh, fixed what went wrong. You you can say to the public, yes, there were these mistakes and and these risks and 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 everything was wrong. But at least we have dealt with that now. We have changed the system. Of course, there can be new crises that uh, come from different sources that can derail us. And, and so I think that is very important. And I, uh, and I think we have done a lot, both in individual countries and, and globally in this regard. So banks are much better capitalized. We have better uh, frameworks around financial stability, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to say my country, uh, the uh, bank system 
has been very sound and that has served us very well in, in this current crisis. So, so uh, uh, to building resilience and, and also by introducing a new framework uh, around financial stability and party monetary policy in Iceland, where uh, you are using more instruments uh, for reaching your goals of monetary policy, you have better interaction between financial stability tools and monetary policy tools, and you are institutional setup to support this. And for instance, in just before I left office in 2019, uh, the law on the central banks were changed. You had the, system, uh, the supervisor was merged into the central bank. You had the system, the three policy committees, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And so far, it has worked well. And the interesting thing is that Patrick was an advisor in this process and, 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 and served very well. And I also see another name here in the audience, Athanasios Rokpanitis, who was also an advisor. Uh, and, uh, and I thank them for that. Thank you, Mara. So defend the solvency of the sovereign, uh, fix the underlying thing that was wrong, and then introduce uh, a new framework. Unfortunately, I have to bring this uh, panel discussion to a close. Let me thank uh, Patrick Honahan and let me thank uh, Mark Goodmanson for a wonderful, wonderful uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. That was great, uh, Patrick. It was great. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was good fun. <laughs>